This year's truly something, but how are you guys doing? Hopefully as good as you can be, seeing as how 2022 seems determined to hit as many bad times bingo spots as it can. Well, one good thing, at least, is we're almost at the end of this book. And kitty! So, two good things. That's something, right? This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to this Cognitive Psychologist marathon of fact-checking and commentary for Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage. One year ago, I thought it would be a sprint, but nope. In this video, we're covering the second half of The Regret, the chapter focused on people who have detransitioned. The first half of the chapter mostly focused on Benji. The description of her home life implied a lot about the context she was living in, specifically regarding how her parents treated her. We spent a bit of time working through Benji's claim that she had joined a cult when she identified as trans. Summary of that is nope. Before getting to the second half, quick refresher for the visual cues indicating where ideas are coming from. This means I'm paraphrasing the book. This means I'm responding to the book or integrating my thoughts with science. Briefly. So brief that I didn't bother moving the camera and everything, although I did change sweaters into this nice, soft, comfortable, citation needed sweater available at my merch store link in the description box. Uh, this is also the setup where we'll talk about Shire's references. Spoilers. It's, it's all blog posts by Helena. We're almost done with this book. The finish line is in sight, so let's just grab that Dixie cup and keep going. Similar to the front half of this chapter, the rest of this will be focused on the experiences of one woman who detransitioned with bits of other people's stories sprinkled in. Schreier has mentioned Helena before. Way back in chapter one, a post by Helena on 4th Wave Now was used to support Schreier's claim about posting destructive behaviors on social media being an easy way to gain followers, as well as to support an increase in those behaviors coinciding with the spread of smartphones. While I've got that reference on screen, I'll remind you that Schreier links to the first part of Helena's proposed three-part series, but is bringing in things from the second. Also, there is no part three. Fourth Wave Now being the blog founded by the mother of someone who came out to her as trans before working on a horse farm for nine months, finding gender-critical blogs, and detransitioning. I mentioned it before, but the Founders Daughters organization, the Peak Resilience Project, has since disbanded and the site linked in the about is no longer their registered domain. In trying to see if that daughter, Kiara, was still active, the most recent thing I found was her being mentioned in a story on the Velvet Chronicle about the 60 Minutes detransition episode, posted not quite a year ago. The Velvet Chronicle calls itself a free-thinking space centered on detransitioned lesbians. That hyperlink for Kiara takes you to the now-defunct Peak Resilience Project website. What is with these websites not bothering to update their about pages? I can see losing track of links inside other people's posts, but come on, this is the about page. You'd think you could update the links now and then. Helena was also someone who told Schreier she was able to get same-day hormones with no fuss in the transformation chapter. Helena being able to do this seems to be the very rare exception as far as hormone prescription experience goes, but I digress. Last thing before starting, Helena is still active on Twitter and just started a substack. Helena, 21, was an angry kid, the daughter of Polish immigrants in Cincinnati, an endocrinologist mom who runs a weight loss business, and an engineer dad. She remembers her busy parents as emotionally remote. She fought with them often and felt their disappointment acutely. This weight loss endocrinologist mention got me curious, so I tried looking up Helena's mom, and it is yet another perplexing rabbit hole to fall down thanks to this book. Before we follow Mr. Rabbit, a quick reminder that an endocrinologist is a medical doctor who focuses on the endocrine system, so is largely concerned with hormones. So a transgender non-binary person seeking hormonal treatment would likely have to see them at some point. Helena is involved with Genspect, an organization that says it's trying to look out for gender questioning youth's best interests. Helena is part of the core team here, and her last name is included in her bio. So using that in a search plus endocrinologist weight loss in Cincinnati and, well, there is a Dr. Kirshner with Weight Loss Center in Cincinnati, but she ain't an endocrinologist. And they do seem to share a bit of a familial resemblance. So combine that with the lack of Kirshner endocrinologists in Cincinnati, and I'm having doubts to the veracity of this endocrinology part Schreier's included. 
Now, I fully admit I could be missing crucial information here. Like, if Helena's mom doesn't share the same last name, it would invalidate everything. But for the little info I could find about Helena's mom, like this Twitter post that mentions her mom getting lip fillers and other work, it seems at the very least plausible Dr. Magdalena Kirshner is her mom. If that is the case, the reason for this change in degree is unknown, but we can probably guess that Helena Schreier, or possibly both, thought it would boost the credibility of Helena's story, but again, this is all speculation. Things were going well in Helena's life until 8th grade, when the girls in her cohort at school hit their Instagram and boys phase, and she felt alienated from them and their new interests. And note 5 is to a guest post by Helena on Lily Maynard's blog. I'm sure many of you could say more here, but briefly, if you're not familiar, Lily Maynard is gender critical and has a child who was put through the ringer by Lily when she said she was trans. The guest post goes into more detail than Schreier includes, but covers a lot of the same ground. I do want to pull out one part, though. That she felt like she had to trade in her personality for looks, basically. I have some thoughts here. I had my crushes at that age, but I was mostly focused on school and dance at that point. A couple years prior, when I started my Shark Week subscription, I got the talk from my parents. And it wasn't about sex, it was to not lose my academic focus. Don't get distracted by the cute boys. I had my future to think of. I think part of it was because they'd heard stories of smart or gifted girls tanking academically in middle school and never recovering. And the idea behind it is that these girls were dropping their grades and not trying at school as hard to blend in better with their peers and to not be an intellectual threat to the boys. In reality, one of the biggest threats to my grades in middle school was my poor choice in best friends. Pro tip to any younger viewers who may be watching, or even adults, if your friends constantly intentionally ditch you and shit talk you, they're not your friends. I'm bringing this up because I know what it's like to be the odd one out in a peer group like that. It's something I felt for chunks of my life, even in grad school. Finding a supportive community during these time periods would be huge. And if somebody finds a supportive community, believes himself to be a member of that community and gets support and encouragement and other positive things from that, oh no? No. I was an awkward teen in the late 90s, so it's not a direct comparison, but I do know that there were trans corners of the web then, and I didn't seek them out, and I certainly ended up in my own weird little corners of the web that I'll leave you to speculate about, but that's not a part that I found. And maybe I didn't find those corners of the web because I don't feel wrong in my gender. As we'll talk about later, there are some aspects of my body shape I feel not great about, but my gender isn't part of what feels wrong. Am I suggesting that youths who Alice their way down the transgender social media rabbit hole do so because their feelings of wrongness in their body goes deeper than the relatively superficial issues? Perhaps. She began losing friends and gaining weight. Her mother forced her on diets, which eventually led her to binge. She stopped organizing skating nights. She began eating lunch alone. I got a lot of acne. I went from just another weird kid like everyone else to THE weird kid. And note 6 is the same guest blog post by Helena as 5. There's putting your kid on a diet, and there's putting your kid on a diet. Given the mom's described interest in lip fillers and having a weight loss clinic, I think it's not a stretch to extrapolate that we're talking about an unreasonable diet especially as this is described as a catalyst for later food binges. But parents know what's best for their kids, right Schreier? I'm finding the urge to make a more detailed comment on the friend situation because I was a weird kid as well. Maybe if I went to a high school that didn't have several thousand students, I would have been the weird kid. But we'll just leave it at it sucks when it feels like you don't have any friends. At the start of high school, Helena hit a I'm not like other girls, I hate girls phase, implied to be a consequence of not sharing interests with the girls at her school. And then she started self-harming and stopped eating. It's not clear if she then found the pro-Anna community on Tumblr or if that preceded those behaviors. These self-harm blogs were not simply the online diaries of depressed teenagers, but a thriving community in which mental illness became an identity, she later wrote. An identity was precisely what Helena had been looking for, and the victim identities appealed to her mental state. 
and note 7 is Helena's fourth wave nail post that Schreier used in chapter 1. As we talked about then, there is some support for sites like Tumblr possibly inadvertently promoting these negative behaviors in users, but shifts in how the sites function can help lessen this effect. Also, it's been a little bit since Schreier directly connected eating disorders or self-harm with a transgender identity, but it's worth repeating that it has been a recurring argument of this book. That age is a time when youths are trying on identities, if they're struggling with psych disorders or not. And this quote seems to imply that Helena was unique for doing so when not really. And it's not exactly a proud period of time for me, but I also went through an ugh, girls suck phase. Part of it was because of the aforementioned middle school friends, but part of it was also the culture. I didn't want to be a mom, play Susie Homemaker, or wear dresses. I wanted to play video games, do science, and wear whatever I wanted to, and fuck anybody who tried to keep me in that patriarchal woman box. It took a while for me to really be able to vibe with the different interpretations of woman. Just because I didn't want the things I didn't want didn't mean that the people who did weren't living their best lives. But of course, Schreier's got to say this is so Helena can claim victimhood. It's always got to be about the oppression Olympics. She found the Harry Potter fandom on Tumblr, which is apparently where the social justice stuff is. And she initially dismissed the post, but felt compelled to keep reading. Also, posts from trans people caught her attention and she related. Helena binge watched videos of trans testimonials and began to strongly empathize with the people in them. She soon realized that her views were converging with theirs. The more I got into it, the more prominent these feelings were of not being a girl. At first, she didn't believe she was a boy. Instead, she would think, I'm anything besides a girl. And note 8 is the fourth wave now post again. Okay, so Helena related to the videos from trans people and felt that she wasn't a girl, but also not quite a boy. If only there was a term for that. I'm not trying or intending to mock Helena here. It's just incredibly frustrating with the denial of trans and non-binary people and where this is going. I pressed Helena about why a young woman today would feel like a failure as a girl. Where did Helena say she felt like a failure as a girl? It hasn't been in anything that Schreier's included, and the closest that Helena comes in her posts is in the pro-Anna mindset. This is a bit of a jump from Schreier. Where do all these young women get the bizarre notion that any young girl who doesn't look like a pageant winner is a loser? Women occupy virtually every job in society, from bus driver to athlete to doctor. So where would they get the idea that they needed to look like the Barbie dolls, a toy parents long ago stopped buying their daughters? Online, she said. Porn, she said. The media, she said. And Trier's doing the trick again, where she technically has a source to back up the claims she's making, despite that source not really being qualified to back up those claims. It's well known that media exposure can lead people, men and women, to feel worse about their bodies. This isn't a new problem, although social media is possibly exacerbating things. Maybe dissatisfaction with one's body can lead a person to feel like a failure of their gender, even. But that doesn't mean that people enrolled in a trans and or non-binary gender identity are doing so because they flunked their assigned gender at birth. Also, whatever you think of the toy line, Barbie is still selling well. Plus, women being in these different jobs is a great start, but that doesn't mean they're viewed or treated equally yet. Schreier said she counter-argued Helena's media claim by saying that Lady Gaga is doing well. Helena said that Gaga, and other women like her, whatever that means, get made fun of. She began to unravel the mystery for me. Women of my generation watched Lady Gaga on the screen or listened to her music in the car. But Helena and her cohort dissected Lady Gaga's persona on social media. They ridiculed her looks, mocked her weight, and trashed her appearance. To me, Lady Gaga seemed the sort of star a talented young woman might seek to emulate. But when girls looked at Lady Gaga discussed on social media, they saw a woman torn apart. This doesn't seem to really hang together for me. Schreier saying that Helena and others her age made fun of Gaga, but then also didn't want to be women because of that ridicule. When Gaga first blew up and for a while afterwards, I remember most of the mocking being in the form of basically saying she had a dick. People like the Gawker authors were millennials, but even Barbara Walters got in on this discussion. These youths didn't invent this phenomenon. It's nothing new. It seems like part of our nature to be shitty to each other, especially with the more well-known a person becomes. 
Women may face different scrutiny and ridicule than men, but there's still plenty of bullshit commentary to go around. If this was discouraging people from being okay with their assigned gender at birth, I would have expected an uptick in like the 80s with those tabloid magazines and TV shows. Later I asked Dagny, another woman who detransitioned, a similar question. Dagny wanted to be a boy for lack of strong female role models. What do you mean every woman has to be feminine? I asked her. Isn't your mom a real woman? She tried not to laugh. Yes, but she was also a mom, you know? Her mother didn't count, she meant. She might as well have been the abominable snowman. I understood. No teenage girl wants to be anything like her mother. How does a perceived lack of female role models link to a woman needing to be feminine link to mom not being a real woman? This is so many logical jumps we're basically hurdling. Information for Dagny's age is not provided, but her feeling a lack of female role models kind of goes counter to an argument Trier used earlier in the school's chapter. That historical strong women role models are being rebranded by the educational system as gender non-conforming. Plus, this also could be coming from the sort of toxic femininity thing. That women can't be strong and also be a mother. And sometimes, people are justified in not wanting to be like their parents. Sometimes it's the bullshit gender norm stuff I talked about earlier, but sometimes it's being dealt a not-ideal parental hand. Anyways, back to Helena's story. Helena's online transition is described as sudden. Over two weeks, focus shifted from general depressed posting to, quote, Queer, trans, gender fluid, non binary, demi boy, valid, problematic, cishets, gender. I'm assuming those are tags from her posts. Quick editing note all references from this point are to Helena's guest post on Lily Maynard's blog. Then she made friends at school. Her new best friend didn't feel, quote, nearly feminine or glamorous enough. At a gay friend's house, they all decided they were trans. The way this is written, possibly intentionally, it sounds like these youths were just sitting around shooting the shit when one goes, you know, I don't think I'm a girl, looks to their left, and their friend goes, oh my god, me too. And then they both excitedly yell, trans, jinx. But I can't imagine that's how these talks generally go. From what I've heard, these tend to be very emotional, vulnerable, and scary experiences. Unless the listening friend is already out as trans and or non-binary, the person who is sharing that information may be justifiably feeling a bit of fear at the possible consequences of sharing their gender identity. And I've seen it tossed around that LGBTQ folk inadvertently gravitate towards each other socially. So if you have a couple people in a friend group who are carrying these secrets and one person finds the courage to say what's going on with them, it may make it easier for other people to share their experiences too. So it's probably not that these other people are finding that they are transit or non-binary because their friend just came out as such, but that friend coming out just made the space a bit safer to talk about that stuff. After coming out locally, Helena came out on Tumblr and was met with a warm response and more followers. And she felt more free than in real life, and that allowed her to post the best of herself. Recall in the first half of this chapter that the warm response after coming out as trans online was called love bombing, a la cults, by Bungie. Can't have people just being supportive. Nope. It's the trans agenda to do that. Also, people editing their documented lives to focus on the good parts is not exclusive to trans youth. Helena had never been anything but another white girl. Suddenly, she was a member of an oppressed minority. She quit figure skating and cut her hair and began binding her breasts. She founded her public school's GSA and changed her name and pronouns at school without telling her parents. Her best friend changed theirs too. Helena had carved herself a niche. Her world may have been narrower, but she no longer had to wonder at her place in it. The fit was snug. Shire is trying to reinforce the idea that these white AFAB youths are doing this, at least in part, to get in on that sweet, sweet minority status. A big problem with that claim is the social cred these kids are purported to get doesn't seem to be a great trade-off for all the negatives that goes with it. Why did Helena quit figure skating? I guess it could be that she would have had to keep doing women's skating to avoid tipping off her parents, but I feel that's saying more about the parents than anything. I also don't understand why this made her world smaller. The energy Helena had put into the pro-Anna space shifted to being trans. She says her, quote, goal went from diet pills to testosterone and wanted to cut off particular body fat areas. She bound with duct tape. Her grades dropped, and in a visit with a school psychologist, the person was affirming and talked about medical transition options. 
Gender dysphoria is, in my understanding of it, a real fucker. Feeling like parts of you are wrong has got to be unpleasant. So in that state, the psychologist was probably correct to try and help her figure out what her options were, since it didn't really seem like that was feasible at home. Also, recall that the proportion of people who detransition because it was not right for them is very, very low. Factors like parental or other social pressure are much more common. In her last year of high school, Helena told her mom that she was trans and would like her appropriate name and pronouns used. Her mom was shocked and demanded to know where she got this idea from. Helena describes using the script that's passed around to boost chances of getting treatment on her mom. How this conversation went can only be inferred from later details. Probably not well. To touch on this again, the script that's being referred to here exists because trans and our non-binary people have some very specific medical hoops to jump through in order to be considered for treatment. One missed step, and they could be back at square one or deny treatment altogether. With a lot of practitioners, there is no margin for error. If we could get rid of the medical gatekeeping, people could be a lot more honest about what they're experiencing and what they need. She quit all her hobbies and felt like her life was on hold until she could start transition. She had a plan to get hormones at 18 and come out fully in college. Around the same time, her AFAB best friend decided she had made a mistake and was going back to her old name and pronouns. This made Helena mad and led to them fighting and ultimately ending the friendship. Granted, I'm distilling this, but even in the text, there is a lot of detail left out. It sounds like her parents weren't being supportive. How much that had to do with her quitting her hobbies is unclear, but it is portrayed in the book as her being trans being her only hobby. And perhaps all her spare time and energy were being focused into her online activities, although I'm not sure how one would be trans as a hobby. But if I'm understanding the subtext correctly, that may have been the main source of positive in her life at that point. I certainly remember the tunnel vision I got towards the end of high school, although I had good friend support by that point. The nature of the arguments between Helena and her friend isn't included, and fair enough, that's private. But Schreier's bringing this up as a sort of demonstration of how Helena's trans identity was alienating her from people, so I think it's worth considering further. A series of arguments because your friends said they weren't trans? I could see that going a couple ways. One possibility is they didn't feel trans was the best fit for them gender-wise. But why would an argument happen at that point? Maybe the friend went the way of Benji and found gender-critical stuff. If that's the case, I could see the friend employing those arguments against Helena and a fight ensuing. Not good. Maybe it was more benign and the friend was still supportive of Helena. In that case, I'd think the argument would almost have to occur because Helena wasn't respecting her friend at that point. Also not good. Another possibility is a friend felt pressured to detransition. I feel like for a friend fight to happen in this context, Helena would be trying to push for the friend to live their truth despite the pressure, possibly because she was feeling the same pressure at home. Or maybe it wasn't really anything profound. Case in point, I had a friend break up with me early in high school. So this is right at the start of my time in high school, I'm trying to move on from those middle school friends, and so I'm hanging out with somebody I knew from dance. She introduced me to a friend of hers, Shelly, and we hit it off. And after a little bit, Shelly mentioned that she felt discarded by our mutual friend. Okay, that sucks, but you know, we hung out and got along great, and then her parents moved out of state. The introducing friend dropped contact at that point, but I stayed in contact over phone and letters and stuff. And at some point, Shelly was able to come back for a weekend to visit, and she hung out with me, like the entire weekend. I asked her if she wanted to call our mutual friend or see if she wanted to hang out or anything. And she said, nah, if she's not interested in me. That's fine. I get back to school that following Monday to a very angry friend. Somebody had seen me and Shelly hanging out and passed that info along to her. And she wanted to know why. Shelly was in town. Why wasn't she told? Why did Shelly sleep over at my house and not her? She'd known her for longer. Meh, 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 meh. And I basically tried to tell her like, look, you ghosted her. You dropped all contact when she moved, and it was her choice to hang out with who she wanted to. And I was finding a new friend group after that. So yeah, without more context for Helena's argument with her friends, it's hard to know what the nature of that argument was and how meaningful it was long term. Soon after Helena turned 18, she drove herself to an informed consent clinic. And the social worker there got the gist that she was experiencing gender dysphoria and sent her off with a prescription for testosterone. One, 
social workers can't prescribe medications. In a lot of places, neither can psychologists. Two, social workers aren't mind readers. If you come in saying you're experiencing a thing and report having the symptoms of that thing, they're going to put it together that you have that thing and that the treatments that work for that thing would probably be good to give you. And I know that this is part of the gender critical argument that these youths can't be trusted, but the data here is that the most effective harm reduction comes from listening to these youths, that they know what they're experiencing. Three, as said before, Getting same-day hormonal treatment seems to be a very rare experience. Helena felt happy that she got the hormones and was initially able to do the injections herself. At college, she made friends with other trans students. And at some point later, she started having trouble doing the injections. She began asking trans-identified friends to do her injections. They did, and she continued on with testosterone. She never grew much body hair, but she liked the way it redistributed her fat and the cool deepening of her voice. Speaking as someone who has struggled with unwanted body fat, I would be horrified if it was redistributed. Getting rid of some of the tummy and like some thigh fat and stuff, cool, I'm down. But that isn't what testosterone does. A reminder that Schreier seems to think that testosterone would be used by AFAB youth to fix the sorts of perceived flaws like I described experiencing. But testosterone is only really a fix if you don't want a feminine silhouette like some AFAB trans and or non-binary youth might. I really want to know why the shift to only using trans identified happened later in the book. Was it a deliberate choice to hide the gender critical term until readers were more on board with things? I'd suppose an alternative explanation could be she happened to shift to it during the course of writing, but with the amount of editing and rewriting typically involved with the book, that doesn't seem too likely. After being on testosterone for an unspecified period of time, she visited her parents back home. Her mother wouldn't use her name or pronouns and told her to, quote, not return home until she came to her senses. Helena describes this as validating because she was finally facing oppression herself. She blocked her parents' phone numbers and cut off contact. Taking that whole denial negative experience from your parents as validating is certainly one way of emotionally dealing with that. My sense for most trans and non-binary people and people of other minority groups is, if given a choice, they would rather not be oppressed, but you do you, Helena. Far from improving her mental health and alleviating Helena's distress, being trans seemed to increase it. She found herself paralyzed with sadness, obsessing over the alleged fact of her oppression as a trans man in American society. That was a thought loop that would go on in my head almost 24-7, she told me. I was so miserable and self-loathing. It sounds to me like she needed therapy to help her deal with everything she was feeling. But Schreier's got to stick that alleged in there as an oppression modifier. Helena started questioning if transition was right for her. When she talked about this online, she said she was encouraged by others to just stick it out, that she would be happy when it was over. And at this point, Schreier says that Helena told her that it felt like she was in a cult because she didn't think she could leave. Something I've heard or read in a fair number of trans and non-binary people's stories is experiencing doubt at some point in the process. And if it comes up, it's not something that should be ignored, but it also doesn't mean that that person is making a mistake. We live in a cisgender normative society, and some people may be raised in a more gender neutral space, but for the most part, we are raised in the gender role assigned at birth. And for most people, that works out for the most part. But if it's not working out for you, you're going to have to go against a lot of social and cultural programming that you've likely experienced since birth on the path to what does work. And that is a lot of inertia to go up against. On top of that is the knowledge of how trans and or non-binary people can be viewed or treated by others. And at some point, some parts of that are going to become lived experience, and you can't know going in how much. So there are a lot of understandable causes for why a person may be experiencing doubt in this process. Plus, it's just normal to doubt when you're making a commitment. Like, am I really sure I want to be doing this as a career for my life? Am I sure I want to be hooking up with this person for the rest of my life? Like, doubt is a normal part of figuring things out for us. Given the rate of detransition because the person feels it ultimately wasn't right for them, the advice to keep going statistically makes sense for most people. Finally, we addressed the cult claim in the last video, so we're not going into it here. 
Elena's oh no moment came when a friend sent her a picture montage of the previous year, and she was hit by a panic about who she had become. She dropped out of college. She realized she'd been horrible to her family. She had alienated two friends who had desisted. She thought about killing herself. She began to see the world she inhabited as not only unhappy, but unhealthy. Helena describes the trans community as miserable, and that even those who seem to be putting on a happy front actually have lives that are catastrophes. That must have been one hell of a picture montage to kick this off. As mentioned in the first part for this chapter, it's not exactly a secret how much pain and suffering can be endured by members of the trans and non-binary community. But that has to be weighed against living an inauthentic life, which for some people is a death sentence. And all of this is just ignoring the good parts that can come with it. It's not just pain. There's gender euphoria. There's the joy that comes at being accepted by others for who you truly are. Painting every trans and non-binary person with a miserable and catastrophic life brush is an unfair characterization. Helena clawed her way back. She reconnected with her family. She told her story online. She began to co-moderate the subreddit that offers support to those thinking of detransitioning, fending off the hordes of ideologues that accuse her of trans hate. Right. That super false and no way connected to reality accusation that she's just hating on trans people. If she was just sharing her story of why transitioning was wrong for her and helping other people in the same position, it'd be one thing. But that isn't what she's doing. Trying to prevent others from transitioning or even getting to identify themselves as trans and non-binary because she knows them better than they know themselves isn't support and it sure as fuck isn't trans love. Schreier includes that Helena founded the Peak Resilience Project with three others to tell adolescents that, quote, you don't have to be transgender. It's possible to live a transgender life if that's what feels right, but it's also possible to have thought you should only to decide you were wrong. As mentioned earlier, the project disbanded in 2020. Something's not sitting right for me with Schreier's description of their message. Maybe part of it has to do with what was highlighted by the start of Kaylin's series on the gender critical movement and how they gradually escalate anti-trans ideology with parents of gender-questioning youth who start out by just trying to find information. If their message was really just, hey, it's cool if you're trans, it's cool if you're not, there would be no issue. If all of this, Shar's book, Littman's papers, the gender-critical parent social media, was to bring awareness to the roughly half a percent of trans and or non-binary people who detransition because it isn't right for them, that would be fine. Plenty of trans and or non-binary people talk about this already. This. Jamie Dodger is incredibly thorough for this, so good video. But if that was the gender critical intent, there wouldn't be the attempts to block access to treatment, to fearmonger about the potential long term effects of medications, to try and paint these AFAB youth as misguided and brainwashed. It wasn't until Kaylin's video that I really understood the message I'll sometimes get from parents that they're glad they found my videos first. Each of the detransitioners I talked to told a remarkably similar story of having had no gender dysphoria until puberty when she discovered her trans identity online. Some, like Kiara, desisted before ever starting testosterone. Kiara's mother sent her to live on a horse farm for a year where she had no internet. The physical labor helped her reconnect to her body, and the lack of internet allowed her to leave her trans identity behind. It didn't click until here that it was the founder of Fourth Wave Now who sent her daughter to do physical labor at a horse farm figures. These story factors aren't the damning pieces of evidence Schreier seems to think they are. Not experiencing gender dysphoria until puberty isn't necessarily uncommon for trans and or non-binary people. Beep. It makes sense if you think about it. Why would somebody necessarily have dysphoric discomfort with parts of their body until they've started developing those parts of their body? A common theme I've read and heard is not being able to pinpoint what the wrong feeling was until stumbling across something that pointed them to more knowledge about trans and or non-binary identities and expressions. We have so many stories from people who tried to embody their assigned gender so hard, then feeling miserable and that it was their fault things weren't feeling right. But let's keep this train moving. You're familiar with confirmation bias, right? I'll spare you the full details here, but just it's it's Schreier being Schreier about trans people's anatomy. First, recall that the detransition rate because it wasn't right for the person is currently understood to be less than a percent. If a person detransitions, 
it's more likely to be caused by external factors, like pressure from parents or partners. Second, the surgical procedure regret rate seems to be comparably low. It is absolutely something that should be brought up in the informed consent process, but the odds seem to indicate the person will not regret the procedure. Third, basically all of the trans and or non-binary people I've spoken to do not express regret about whatever steps of transition they've taken. If anything, regret is expressed in not having undergone different transition steps sooner. But Schreier and I are sampling from different populations. She rallies behind the gender critical flag and I behind the LGBTQ. Her ability to find people with these sorts of stories isn't surprising given the circles she's running in. By the way, Littman has another paper out now, based on survey data from people who have detransitioned. The title spells out the purpose of this paper pretty well. The survey data is from people who underwent some form of medical or surgical transition for gender dysphoria, then at a later point detransitioned. Respondents were recruited via unspecified parts of Tumblr, Reddit, Twitter, and a D-Trans Facebook group. Similar to her rapid onset gender dysphoria paper, her choice for recruitment sites has potentially skewed her data and conclusions. It's possible that people who went through these steps but didn't drift to gender critical websites wouldn't give the same reasons or feel they had not been adequately evaluated. Final point here. Schreier was full of references for adverse effects of medical treatments before, but the citations seem to have dried up. Not saying these things can't or don't happen, just that it's interesting they're absent here. Each of the D-sisters and D-transitioners I talked to reported being 100% certain that they were definitely trans until, suddenly, they weren't. Nearly all of them blamed the adults in their lives, especially the medical professionals, for encouraging and facilitating their transitions. It's possible that the people Schreier spoke to were in the less than 1% of people who undergo some steps of transition then ultimately feel it isn't for them and it would be good to understand what's going on in that subset to be better able to help people moving forwards. It's also possible that the people Schreier spoke to were in a mixed bag of situations. Some who came to not feel right having transitioned, some who detransitioned because of external pressure, like from parents, and some who are in a position like Benji, where they say they're still experiencing gender dysphoria but identify as cisgender lesbians after finding the gender critical space. In my opinion, the second option for Shreya's sample seems to be more likely, given the gender-critical activities of the more featured stories. Blaming everyone but themselves for the transition steps they took, for one, is robbing themselves of agency. If it were true that they were leaving a cult, and I am 100% not saying that's the case, but for the sake of argument, I would think it would be an important part of the healing and growth process to take ownership of the role you played in joining that cult. Failing to do that step only really sets you up to repeat that mistake again in the future. The second problem with blaming medical professionals and other adults is it sets them up as irresponsible actors, and it's probably the case that this is the point. Undermine their authority and the current standards of care to prevent trans and our non-binary youth from getting access to the treatment they need. Benji reinforces my points by giving advice, said to be for those, quote, considering detransition. Basically, that you didn't decide to transition on your own. You were enabled by those around you entrusted with your care, who she says weren't actually looking out for your best interests. Schreier continues to rob these youth of agency by saying that even at 18, they shouldn't be trusted to make these sorts of choices. So the youth can't trust themselves, and they can't trust medical professionals, teachers, or parents who are gender affirming, so who does that leave? The anti-trans segment of the population? That makes sense. Many detransitioned young women have since come to believe they were just young lesbians who had internalized homophobia and been led to believe that not being typically feminine meant they weren't female at all. Nearly all of them struggled with mental health and engaged in self-harm. And as I spoke to each of them, I wondered how much easier things might have been if, instead of turning to their iPhones, they had gone to the mall together and pierced their ears or smoked a cigarette. That's quite the flippant alternative for AFAB gender questioning youth. Get off your damn phones and get to smoking at the mall. Top shelf advice there. And unless things have changed, in most places you either need parental permission or an indifferent piercer to get things done before you're 18. Look at this bad boy. 17 at Hot Topic. But more to the point, and despite Schreier's claims to the contrary, there's still room for tomboys and lesbians. Schreier claims that the favorite dogma of gender ideologues is that kids know who they are, 
which is then implied to also incorporate the belief that a person's gender is fixed. No, it's pretty well accepted that a person may need to feel things out for a bit, and even then, it's not set in stone. And that's not even getting into gender fluidity, which Schreier took issue with in the therapist chapter. Here's the point, and it's an important one. There is life after detransition. The psychological struggles that lead a young AFAB person to transition are often acute. More than likely, even after transition, they remain. Then they weren't terribly short-term, were they? At some point, we all have to face our struggles and sorrows. The implication here seems to be one of the recurring arguments from this book, that these AFAB youth are transitioning in an attempt to run away from their anxiety, depression, or other life trouble. While some people do have psychological disorders on top of gender dysphoria, or just in addition to their gender identity, it doesn't mean that those psychological disorders caused any of that. And let's wrap this up with the rest of Shire's closing thoughts for this chapter, which feel Peterson-y in style and tone. There's, quote, worse mistakes to have made than transition, and that many of the changes are reversible through plastic surgery, if nothing else. She just undermined her book a bit here. Social media doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, and we may soon drop it altogether. I would suppose it difficult to use the internet if the planet's fucked. We are, quote, doomed to hurt those we love and will probably not be the people our parents wanted us to be, possibly disappointing them along the way. Parents don't have to have these huge expectations for their kids. I'd actually think that setting up these kinds of hopes for your kids, instead of just that they be as happy and healthy as it can be, would only be setting yourself up for disappointment, regardless of what your child does. But good news! You can try to get back in your parents' good graces. By what, exactly? detransitioning if that's the thing that made them upset? That's not toxic and heartbreaking in the least. If you want to detransition, do so now before you transition further. Given who the target audience of this book seems to be, this last part seems like a weird fit. But I suppose it could be used as a sort of inspiration, isn't the right word, but that's what we're going to roll with. Inspiration for parents who are unsupportive to keep hassling their child that it's not too late for them to turn back and undo the changes they did and just be the child their parent wants them to be. Well, that was a chapter. I'll say that. At this point in the book, I don't think there's anything terribly surprising. Awful? Absolutely. Disappointing? Yes. But surprising, given what Schreier said previously? No. Like I said in the previous video, it almost seems like Benji and Helena's stories were Schreier's starting point, and the chapters leading up to it were to lay the groundwork for what they had to say. One of the claims deployed in this chapter was that trans rights activists deny the existence of people who have detransitioned. Hopefully, I've made the case that that isn't true. Another claim that was floated is that people who have detransitioned are either ridiculed or exiled by transgender non-binary people. Given the context we see in this book, it seems more likely that some people, like Benji or Helena, yeeted themselves out when they embraced, vocally, the gender-critical ideology. That was what fostered the negative responses they got. And yeah, that is it for this chapter, and we're almost done with this book. We're getting there. So until next time, bye!
Okay. Uh, 